Don is here today to help us better understand the quest for crawl rank. Make sure to stick around after the webinar for the Q&A, and please do ask your questions via the GoToWebinar interface throughout the webinar, and I'll be picking some questions at the end to ask. We'll be recording this webinar and adding it to our Calc site within our show notes, and we'll send an email out uh, with the link when it's live. I'll pass you over to Don. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm pleased that uh, Joyce has, has asked me to join you today, and hopefully you'll find what I'm going to share with you really useful. I know that uh, it's something that's a really big interest of mine and has been for a number of years now. Um, there's a concept called crawl rank, which, uh, I have, as I say, I have a particular interest in, but I believe that there's a, the opposite effect of that, which is crawl tank, which can happen on really big websites and it, you know, it can, can impact really negatively. So for me, it's really important that you take care of crawls and use any, in, use any crawl budget that you have allocated to your IP stroke domain uh, intelligently. So with Without further ado, I shall press on. So, as we know, the web is big. It's actually absolutely huge, uh, and it's thought to have increased by a third in size since 2013 alone. Um, you know, we all say, oh, make more content, content is king, etc. But unfortunately, we're kind of just flooding the internet with more and more and more URLs from to crawl. Uh, even Sir Tim Berners-Lee seemed to be quite surprised when he tweeted that um, we've recently passed a billion websites by the count of the internetlifestats.com. The index web is thought to contain at least 4.73 billion pages as of November 2015. And um, an article even as far back as 2008 by Jesse Alpert on the official Google blog um, entitled We Knew the Web Was Big, uh, speaks of a trillion individual unique URLs uh, being on the web at once. So even they were shocked. So obviously, this ability to self publish has clearly influenced this. As I say, we do all love content. And obviously, when we have the likes of CMSs and all the dynamically uh, generated URLs that come out of the likes of open source e-commerce platforms like Magento, you know, PrestaShop and so forth, and the introduction of um, things like PHP, which means that people can just dynamically generate lots of things, tens, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of, of pages, um, has impacted with us going from, you know, around just over two million websites in 1998 to you know, um, a billion websites. That's websites. Can you imagine how many URLs that includes individually? Oh, it's huge. So, obviously, there is a capacity on, on everything, and there are capacities on web crawling systems, not just Google's, but the other search engines as well. So they've had to respond uh, in a way by understanding what is the important content to crawl and what is maybe the less than important content to crawl. So they've had to develop prioritization systems and um, implement crawl scheduling, crawl frequency. Effectively, they've created schedules for Google bots to go out there and gather um, data from URLs. Because everything has a finite capacity, here's some of the actual um, crawl, um, crawl schedule and um, patents that, that Google's developed over the years. And they're constantly being updated. There seem to be almost more of them coming through, so it's it's almost becoming a bigger and bigger issue for them in that they're looking to refine things that go along. And this particular uh, patent, the scheduler for a search engine crawler by Zhu et al, um, talks of um, at the end of 2003, the web is believed to include well in excess of 10 billion distinct documents. So the search engine may have a crawling capacity that is less than half as much. But it's not just about which URLs to include in the crawl, but which URLs to exclude as well. And this is uh, quite a big focus, really, of, of, this, of this talk. So here's another uh, glimpse of some of, the, some of the crawl schedule patents that are out there. Um, schedule seems to get mentioned quite a bit in, in, in titles of these. And it seems prioritization 
and crawl efficiency are becoming increasingly important. One in particular, um, managing items in a crawl schedule speaks of a three-tiered system in which this, they've, they've developed, whereby uh, URLs are almost bucketed into like three different distinct types of crawls. The real-time crawl, which actually isn't exactly real-time, but it means that um, you are a URL which can be crawled multiple times a day, um, is really for the most important pages out there. Those that change often, those that are, are strong, those that have you know many many external links pointing at them, or they you know, they're just really important. They could be like the home page of CNN's uh, website, so they naturally get a kind of a, a, a boost. So they're constantly visited. It may be updated, you know, every minute or something like that. So it might get lots and lots of visits every day from Googlebot. Then there's the daily crawl, which you know the patents mention daily or bi-daily, you know, maybe once or twice a day. So less important, change a little bit less often, but, you know, they're just slightly less important. And then you've got this whole massive base layer crawl, which is just the vast majority of URLs out there. And because they are, um, because there's literally millions and millions and millions of URLs that fit into that category or that layer, um, it's not really efficient to sort of just go from one end of it to the other and start again. So this particular patent, the managing new items in a crawl schedule, speaks of how the base layer crawl is set, split up into segments um, and with, a, with an active segment selected on almost like a round robin basis, so kind of random, just eventually we'll get around everything. And if the segment is active, then that is crawled. And as I say, really it's just for the ordinary average URLs far less important. Um, so to just give you a little bit more of an idea of how this, you know, things work really, I think it's kind of key to understand the major roles of the, the key characters that make up the, the search engine um, heart, if you like. We obviously have the 10 different types of Googlebot, which cover things like media in the form of news, images, video, uh, the, all the different mobile ones, there's a new one just been added recently um, and then you've got good old Google Webbot and um, as I said I've mentioned images so there's, and then there's obviously the paid media one, so there's AdSpot, AdSense Spot that are more really around quality scoring uh, um, so for instance the quality score for, for ads and the same for AdSense bot, so that's more a case of, uh, again, same thing, sort of quality and relevance for paid advertising. And then you have the URL scheduler who is massive, absolutely massive, because he's, if you like, um, Googlebot's line manager. Um, he takes data from the history logs, looks at the change frequency of pages, and if you like, the important scores of URLs, uh, and um, basically just builds all these kind of worksheets, if you like, gives Googlebot the bucket list of URLs to visit. And then you have the indexer and ranking engine who ultimately once all the data is come back by Googlebot, and Googlebot weighs it all up, looks at the historical uh, logs, the link logs, the anchors, etc., and in the fullness of time, indexes and ranks. Uh, I'm not going to go over that too much of this because literally I've just sort of talked about you know the history logs etc. Um, they ultimately give data so that there's that change frequency can predict can be predicted and change weight based on what's actually changed um, and the weight of the changes that have, have happened because not all change is considered equal. I'm going to come to that a bit more in a second. Uh, as I say, the team leader, the URL scheduler, can't emphasise the importance of this enough. Literally, is get dishing out work schedules to Googlebot all the while, um, and deciding whether URLs go into the real time, the daily, or the base layer segment. Um, but it, another key thing is it also drops hints to Googlebot. Now, if you recall, I mentioned that they were looking at ways in which they could um, 
choose URLs not to visit. So one of the patents or a number of the patents speak about hints. Now hints are really built in to stop Googlebot from going down dodgy paths. In that dodgy paths I mean like infinite loops or empty crawl spaces or to understand patterns whereby pages may be kind of the same. So if you're generating lots and lots of duplicate pages, uh, you know, 90 odd percent the same, even more, um, then it's likely that eventually Googlebot will kind of stop going down that path because it's picking up on these hints that have been built in. Think about the URL scheduler as an air traffic controller for Googlebots. Dishing out budget and, um, and giving lists, bucket lists of URLs for Googlebot to visit. Uh, as I say, these are the Googlebots. Image, video, news, the media types, the paid search types, uh, our favourite Googlebot web search we know from, from old, and obviously the mobile ones. The apps one is the, is the newbie, um, just, just recently added. So what does Googlebot do? I'm talking about Google Webbot, but this can apply to a lot of them in, in many ways. Uh, well, Googlebot ranks nothing at all. Literally, Bot visits the list, that the URL scheduler has give, given it to it, and the job does vary, and the busyness of that bot does vary dependent on the type of bot it is. For instance, image bot really doesn't do anywhere near as much crawling because images change less frequently. The same with things like PDFs. Google bots an errand errand girl or boy. Um, it takes a note of all the outbound linked pages and additional links doesn't necessarily crawl them and um, takes the list back for future scheduling by the URL scheduler and as I say takes hints from the URL scheduler with regards to the types of content that are going on and the levels of you know this is all the same, this is all the same, this is all the same, looking for a needle in a haystack, hey, 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 lots of hay. So Googlebot's kind of quite a gossip really tells tales, tells tales to the history logs and the history logs in turn then go and tell the URL scheduler for future scheduling. The indexer mentioned that, you know, it really just takes a view of everything and just um, outputs um, the results accordingly. So I, I, I was really interested on in some of the the ways in which Googlebot was visiting really, really old URLs and the concept of importance. And it does seem that important URLs are crawled in preference to unimportant ones. So I'd seen this incident whereby I was trying to get rid of really, really old URLs on a website and they almost just kept coming back like zombies, checking the server logs. Like find that Googlebot just from part time to time was just constantly like visiting them. And John confirmed that two things. A, low importance URLs do appear to be queued for later, so once Googlebot's visited everything that's important, if there's a bit of spare capacity then it'll just keep checking things like four you know, even if you've got like a four ten there to say these are gone, it'll just periodically check just to make sure from time to time. Um, but also, John has confirmed another number of other things that URLs are not crawled in order, as we've said, but that some receive multiple daily crawls, some daily, some weekly, and some very infrequently, dependent on change, and obviously a num number of other factors. You can look that up there on the SEO, uh, Search Engine Round table um, when John's explaining why there are delays in Search Console reporting. So. That question that I asked to John about, you know, pages that seem to be visited more than others and um, queues and so on, seem to support this particular pattern, where priority scores are determined on crawling based around page importance scores of documents. Uh, so a priority is given definitely to to the to the more important pages in visiting. And that again now brings me to the subject of crawl budget. Um, in an interview with Eric Eng in 2010, 
this this issue was was discussed. Um, it's essentially an allocation of call visits to a host. Now, I asked John about um, you know how it was actually calculated and whether it was at a domain level, and it's not. It's actually at an IP level and then shared amongst the sites that are sharing the IP. So it could be if you're on a shared hosting. You know, you you get slightly less budget, but John mentioned that it's very very rare that actual sites max out their budget as such. But it's supposed to be roughly proportionate to page rank and host speed. Pages with a lot of links get crawled more, and the vast majority of them don't get much budget allocated to them, which kind of supports the base layer um, model. So very rarely do they get visited. They're just there with all the other low importance pages. And as I say, you know, IP is the level at which um, crawl allocation is dished out. It occurred to me, in light of the 2012 disavow tool, um, that if crawl budget was allocated based on, uh, in part, you know, page rank and links and so on, that if, you know, there are loads and loads of people were, were disavowing a huge amount of backlinks. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I've seen sites that have like 90% of the backlinks from pre-2012 disavowed now. And it kind of occurred to me that, you know, this would impact crawling. You know, John said that maybe, maybe not, links help us to understand the site, but it's not the only thing driving crawling. Which kind of takes us a little bit away from the whole conversation that Eric and uh, Matt had in 2010, which was ultimately really around crawl budget and um, crop page rank, if you like, and and host load. So there are other things maybe that are starting to come in. That said, you know, in my opinion, if you massively disavow your backlink profile, you probably need to restructure to flatten it all out so that. Any equity that's coming in at a higher part of the website needs, you know, is able to reach, you know, the areas that you want it to. Um, but again, furthermore, it does seem that there's like some other factors that are coming into play now since 2010. This is a conversation that Andrew Blipat said with had with Amon Johns, um, that was, you know, the well-known conversation really that was kind of around rank brain and the important factors that are in place now in terms of rankings where Andrew said is links and content. Uh, but Amon asked him a little bit about um, crawl budget and Andrew said, um, you know, there's, there's things have changed. Um, lots of things have changed now. Um, so, you know, definitely there's something out there that's, 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 that's different to how it used to be. So I asked John, I asked him whether there was any other factors now that are affecting crawl, crawl budget, um, as well as page rank and speed. And he said, sure, you can ask, but he never actually told me what they were. Um, but from what I can gather, and from lots and lots of things that are mentioned in Webmaster Hangouts, it does seem that change how often a URL changes is, you know, it has quite a big impact. It seems to be a really big factor. And, you know, lots of people think that if they kind of change a URL just a little bit or spin things around or add some randomization, that um, that this is going to, is going to, oh, God, sorry about this. Oh, sorry. Oh, God. Sorry about that. That this is actually going to impact how often Googlebot comes back to their site, but not so because not every change is considered equal. For instance, if you change the price or the availability of a product according to this patent, minimizing visibility of stale content in web searching, it's weighted higher than, you know, for instance, changing the color of something or, you know, size maybe of something. And it's really driven by this particular um, line of uh, mathemat maths, if you like. This um, 
equation where weight multiplied by feature um, essentially impacts whether a change, a big enough change has occurred for Googlebot to be sent back. And as I say, change, past changes, how often the page changed is mentioned a lot in Webmaster Hangouts and it's also mentioned a lot in a lot of the patents as well. And as I say, it's not just random change like shuffle or round where you literally just spin the content around. In fact, that's probably more likely to get you um, into a situation where you're actually considered to be dropping hints and Googlebot will pull back. Um, one thing that John does mention a lot is be consistent. He was asked at the, for his top SEO advice, you know, when we kind of have a lot of these questions that are asked towards the end of the year, what would be your advice for, you know, this the next year? And John said, be consistent. Now, for me, um, given that the history log builds up data about change frequency uh, to predict the future change and, you know, important scores, um, I would say that that's probably to do with the history logs because Googlebot essentially gets, you know, crawl schedules based on historical data that's stored on the, on the URLs to go along. Um, but obviously there will be other things as well like anchor text consistency throughout a site um, and, and a lot of signals as well that point to you know which are the key pages, which are the most important pages, which are the heroes if you like amongst many pages that may be reasonably similar. And as I said, don't bore Googlebot. Don't bore him by adding things like spinning random stuff. Um, you know, same pages, every page, this, you know, all the same and huge massive boilerplate areas of no individual content in, in a, a, a tiny little bit in the middle because what will happen is over time the URL scheduler will become known that your site is quite boring and Googlebot will just pull back. Now, it kind of frustrates me that people don't necessarily think that this is, is all important stuff. Well, crawl budget is really important and Google thinks so. They wouldn't be saying that it's important for an SEO to understand crawl budget and saying when they advertise for a search engine optimization manager that you need to understand crawl budget if it didn't actually have any impact whatsoever on SEO. Um, so you know, they believe it's important. Uh, whilst there's no one has officially said there's any kind of ranking benefit, my thoughts are that there are by the emphasis of importance within a website. You know, enter crawl rank. Um, AJ Cole back in 2013 said that in his opinion and his experience, if you get the low to no page rank pages that are you like in the lower end of the um, of a website, you know, a lot of product pages maybe or pages on e-commerce sites or directory sites, if you can get those crawl more frequently than competition, you felt there was almost like an element of crawl rank and looked to be like a consistency between um, the if you get them crawled more than your competitors, it seems to be like a, a benefit in terms of rankings. But, you know, I'm not 100% sure that this is actually what's happening. Um, so I've spent quite a bit of time actually looking at this and testing lots of things over the years. So back in January, I, I, I went back to AJ and um, asked him whether he still felt that it was relevant because obviously three years is a long time in search. And he said, you know, he still sees evidence that game pages crawl frequently, seems to have an impact on their ability to rank well. And I think that maybe it looks a little bit like this, you know, where you see lots of uh, long tail leapfrogging where it's almost like a last last lap, um, an endless last lap between pages that have little to no equity in them, very low strength pages on big sites uh, where the you know it's very rare that they have like external links because there are so many of them. They all vary a little bit from each other, uh, so there's perhaps not that much between them, uh, other than they have if you like, they're crawled more less, they're crawled more than the competitors are crawled. 
because they may be short and crawl paths within their website. And how it appears to work is this, you don't always have to fight the boss URLs. So effectively, you're, you're, you're using like a very, very wide layer of low to no page pages on quite a big scale. Because every site out there will have strong pages, particularly in, so for instance, you know, the e-commerce platforms and the directory structures where you really don't stand that much chance if you're not huge at beating them. Um, but even those sites have really, really small, really, really low page rank and low strength pages. These are the pages that you're ultimately looking to beat by sharpening up your, your, uh, your crawling at that, at that level. But, you know, rather than crawl rank, I almost think that it's a big emphasis of uh, importance. So by using things like internal link strategies, you're actually um, using crawl efficiency and crawl budget well, and you're emphasizing the important URLs out there. Back in 2010, in that same interview between Eric King and Matt Coates, this conversation was about faceted navigations and saying that it's actually they're quite a problem really because you can end up with um, you know infinite loops, lots and lots of URLs that you know effectively are the same content. So Matt mentions many many times the most important parameter, the most important uh, path to this particular piece of content. So it supports a lot of the patents that are around. URL importance. If you don't emphasize them well, it seems that you almost dilute them um, because Googlebot doesn't quite know which is the actual most important from a number of different URLs with the same out output. This also seems to support um, a, a document by, by page, uh, which is, you know, from many, many years ago that Bill Slowski pointed me to and you know, I, I was just say, like to say thanks to Bill because I had some really interesting conversations with him about patents and crawling and so forth. Which, again, same thing. It's always about the most important pages, and um, when there is a web that has an infinite, sorry, that has like an infinite capacity. Switch my phone off. Yeah. See, Googlebot is pointing to it, uh, is looking for a needle in a haystack, and the haystack is massive. If you like, it's, you know, every website is a haystack in a, a mass of other haystacks. Um, it's hunting for the relevant needles. You need to point out those relevant needles, and as I say, the use of things like internal link structures uh, and, you know, strengthening up. The, the key unique URLs amongst many similar ones is 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 it's very important to this. Don't just make your haystack bigger by adding more content. Work on improving the the signals that point to the important needles of hair. Because how otherwise how will Google want know which are the most important ones? So for instance, internal links, they count a lot. I look at so many sites where their internal link structure is kind of all over the place. Maybe they've employed tagging, they've gone absolutely crazy, you know, they've got lots of random things going on. Their home page is, is like 50th in the most internally linked pages. Uh, and their important category pages are below their blog. So it's kind of all a little bit out of sync, really. Even Google says, from this piece of uh, uh, text here, the number of internal links is a, is a signal about the relative importance of that page. If you've not got your key pages high up in this list, then you need to think about restructuring or consolidating your internal link structure so that actually you're giving the, the right signal. And you'll often find as well that pages, the websites that are kind of dynamic and they end up with lots of the product pages outranking their categories and their subcategories, it's almost like they're just, they've got this out of sync, it's all over the place. Now, you know, we've mentioned crawl rank, but is there an opposite, a crawl tank? 
and this is why crawling is so important and people kind of need to get their head around that. Um, it's a negative event, uh, consequences from poor crawl visits, spider traps, infinite loops, endless, endless URLs uh, that have just become visited less and less because there are just too many of them. Well, I've seen that. I've seen crawl tank. It's not pretty at all. It's effectively SEO death by too many URLs, insufficient crawl budget to support the number of them. You know, for instance, where somebody gets clever and decides to add, you know, another 20 subcategories uh, to all the category pages, and all of a sudden, you know, they, they just there just isn't the allocation or crawl budget to actually reach those nether regions. Well, I've been there, done that. It's terrible. It looks a bit like this. Um, you kind of fall off a cliff quite quickly. It's almost like exponential URL on importance, where they're exponentially consistently confirmed to be unimportant to queries with every crawl visit from Googlebot. Lots of URLs competing for the same query and it's just irrelevance. It's just confirmed over and over. Still, you know, every SEO needs a flat line of sight to resurrect and make better. You know, I'm, I'm the same as everybody else. I make mistakes. I, you know, tear things down and hopefully try to build things back up. And when you tear things down, you actually learn a lot about these things. Um, so how can we use the likes and dislikes of Googlebot and the things that we find in the um, patents to to heal and repair sites that maybe have suffered from negative crawling. You know, we know that Googlebot likes going with the action is because there's a predictability of change. We know that Googlebot likes speed. Google's always saying speed up your website. Googlebot will be given a bucket list and you know you need to try and get Googlebot to get around that bucket list with each visit. Otherwise, you know, you end up with this backlog almost. Logical structure you've got to give the right response codes. There's lots and lots of things here, but you also need to bear in mind a lot of the things that Googlebot doesn't like as well at the same time. So here's what I made earlier. This is a, a smallish personal project of mine that I've had for quite a while. I use it to test lots of things on. I would say it's not HTTPS, but actually I'm kind of half not hanging my head in shame because I've literally just switched this over now to a CDN, so it is HTTPS. Hey, that was kind of last week. Um, but it isn't mobile friendly at this moment because it's very dynamic and it has to be all coded by me, etc. It's not got VC backing, so it's just, you know, I chip away at it and it's, it's a quite a big enough site for me to be able to test things on, um, you know, at, at reasonable scale. So what I started to do with this is um, look at the server logs and see when Googlebot was crawling certain URLs and then shorten crawl paths back into them. So I was using this um, URL, if you call it crawl frequency clocking, to see how often Googlebot was visiting pages on the website, certain areas, sections, categories and subcategories, and taking a note of it. This spreadsheet. Um, John Mueller provided to a bunch of webmasters and to everybody really in the webmaster hangout and um, you can get it there at that short code uh, that short short link um, maybe do some, some of your own URL crawl frequency clocking so you can get a good feel for the parts of the site that Googlebot thinks is important or not important and then I started to do things like flatten architecture uh, utilize internal link strategies, you know, use some cross-modular internal linking, XML sitemaps, and built out some of the hub pages to make them, if you like, more important. And also just got rid of lots and lots of pages that were, you know, kind of ish, kind of similar, flattened it all back, you know, used a 410 gone because that's kind of the nearest thing you can get to saying to Googlebot this is gone although as mentioned from time to time Googlebot does seem to come back just to check in case you made a mistake and all of a sudden those URLs are back. That does seem to sort of drop away a little bit over time as well um, 
And you can see there, there's nearly a million 410 guns there. And it started to, it seemed to, to kind of work. Uh, we started to get quite a lot of the pages at the lower levels of the site moving back up, fighting against the um, the lower strength pages of competitors, much bigger competitors than us. Competitors with, you know, huge venture capitalists or uh, PLCs even. So you would say, well, you know, there's that's not a very difficult query, but you, know, you still have all the local people there, you still have all these other bigger sites than us, and there's 40,000 towns, villages and cities across the UK. That's a lot of long tail query volume to go on. So it's kind of worth working at, and um, it applies to not just Google, I think it seems to work with the likes of Bing as well, you can see here. So it's kind of alive that website that I've tanked historically um, via you know, too many URLs. It's kind of alive, it needs some work, it's not pretty, it needs making better, but you know, it's kind of had its little heart monitor put back on and its, it's heart is beating a little bit again. But was that pro rank or was it the emphasis of URL importance better than competitors on those pages? I kind of think so, it's almost like it's uh, is it correlation or causation? It seems almost like important pages get crawled more. If you make the pages more important, they get crawled more, uh, rather than actually them ranking more because you internally linked or um, you know you've got them to be visited more frequently. I think it's the fact that you utilised internal linking strategies to emphasise importance where there are many many other options available as candidates for queries. And as I say, there are exclusions. You know, you need to make sure you're getting rid of hint trippers and things like that along the way. It just does seem it's all about consistency, consistency of anchors, consistency of internal paths, not saying to Google, oh well, here's a here's what I want to rank for shoes, but also I have this red shoe size four that's getting linked to with the anchor that says shoes by many pages. You know, how will Googlebot know? Because all the signal signals kind of are kind of split, really. But you may also say, oh well, what if a page that is is not getting crawled frequently, can that still rank? Well, yes. I'll give you an example. Uh, on a company website, a uh, page such as, you know, the appointments of directors, or, um, yeah, so, a PLC that, that has appointments of its board, that's not going to change that often because a board is unlikely to change frequently. But when it does change, it's it, it um, it's important. So that's always going to be an important page because you know it's high up in a website. It's massively important to the brand, to the organisation. It's always likely to rank highly, maybe in you know site links for for a brand. They can still be important even if they're not put, they don't change that often. And all of this kind of does seem to support um, something recently that was mentioned when um, Google was speaking at one of the SMX or the X search engine summit, search engine journal summit, um, saying be smart about your tags and site architecture, stay fresh and relevant. Um, Either way, it's really important that all the checks and balances are indicating that you're still on track. You need to test things regularly, check crawl paths, check server logs to make sure that Googlebot's not going off course because, you know, rockets on big sites, if they do spiral out of control, it's really, really easy for them to go off on a terrible trajectory and then it's really hard to bring them back on course. And that's kind of about it. I hope that you found that useful. Um, you're always more than welcome to give me a shout if you want me to answer any questions. Apologies for my phone ringing throughout the uh, throughout the uh, webinar. Uh, I do apologise for that. And as I say, please feel free to contact me if you want any further information. And if I can help, I will do. Cheers. Thank you.
That was great. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, don't worry about your phone. <laughs> um, okay. Before we launch into the Q&A, just a reminder for everyone that we've recorded this webinar, and I'll be posting it on the Calc website soon, so you can rewatch it at your convenience. Uh, and as attendees, you'll get an email with the link as well. I've got a few questions for you, if that's OK, Dawn. Yeah. OK. Sure. So, um, do you think that the quality of sites you find yourself near on shared hosting can have a significant impact on ranking, both through crawl and through other factors? Uh, well, I, I remember that when I asked John that question, he said, um, I'm not sure that the quality of websites has a massive impact, to be fair. This is my, my thoughts. But when I asked John whether um, it mattered if, for instance, you were on a dedicated server or, you know, for instance, you were using a CDN to speed, etc., uh, he said it, it does help sometimes if you're on a if you've got your own space. So whilst I'm not condoning that you rush out and get a dedicated server and spend a huge amount on it for a smallish website, which you probably won't have a huge amount of crawling activity on it anyway, um, on a big site, you're probably better off being in your own space. But quality-wise, I'm not sure that that really makes much difference, to be honest. OK, yeah. great. Um, and can you talk a little bit more on the impact of crawl on disavowed links or domains? Do they cease to crawl the commonly disavowed? Um, well, my understanding is that in actual fact, um, links out of the page, are, it's a strange one with, with, um, with disavowed links, and I think I'm correct on this, in that in actual fact, what happens is Googlebot crawls a page, and the pages are noted that that are linked to. So it's almost as though any impact on uh, that kind of thing would come from the site that has been disavowed from. If that makes sense, yeah. So yeah. it's it's the other way around, yeah. Uh, and hence, this is partly why for me. If you disavow a site, you probably at some point or another want Googlebot to visit that new website to make a note of links out. So for me, it literally is not links in that count when they're crawled, but links out of the page that are noted and they are then added to the link logs and the anchor logs. Yeah. But what I would say is this if you disavow a massive amount of your backlink profile, for me, you're probably going to have to restructure your website to flatten it out. I'm not talking about if you've got a small website. I'm talking about if you've got a massive website and you disavow a huge, huge amount. For me, you probably are not going to get the strength that you thought you had at all in the lower regions of a website. So that my advice would be to flatten it or find other ways to get the equity flowing around in that website. Maybe build hub pages that connect to the low, you know, it's almost like to be able to tie it all back together a little bit. Um, mm. That's my view anyway. That's great. One more question. Um, so uh, I think I have upset an image bot with a four or four hours after site move and nowhere to put them. Would upsetting one bot impact overall crawl budget? Uh, no, because I think uh, my understanding is that they are treated differently, yeah? So I can't imagine that images uh, or image bot would be doing something on, well, 404s don't necessarily um, impact crawl budget anyway. Um, I remember Gary, you saying that people, if anybody said that 404s were bad, that they're bad. <laughs> They're a bad person because sometimes 404s actually are, you know, it's not an unhealthy site that has 404s. Uh, sometimes 404s literally are the best thing because thinks that if something's gone. But if that's an accident, I would literally just kind of repair it and just 
just wait for things to happen again. Maybe, you know, if it was you or ours, I'd say maybe shorten some paths into those so that Googlebot realizes and maybe add things to sitemaps to emphasize again, oh, these are back. Same thing though, if you're looking to get rid of something, add the 404 10s or 404 s to sitemaps. Sitemaps I cannot like stress enough. Um, same with images, image sitemaps, use image sitemaps because it's they're a way of us speaking to Googlebot, whether it be Googlebot images or Googlebot webbot. So that should heal itself quite quickly really, in my view. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Dawn, uh, and I hope to see everybody soon at our upcoming webinars later this week. Okay, thanks, Joyce. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Thank you.